But I want doctors and just the healthcare industry to understand that like telling a patient who struggled with their weight that they just need to use willpower to lose weight is you know, borderline harmful. Like the, the research shows that willpower doesn't work. You cannot do that. Like it's just not helpful. And, and doctors need to be armed with better resources and better information to help their patients. And that doesn't necessarily mean what they should eat and not eat. It means backing it out and going like, how can you actually get the support that you need? Dr. Katrina Ubel is a pediatrician turned master certified life and weight loss coach. She helps busy women identifying physicians permanently end their overeating and weight struggle through life coaching and the latest weight loss science. And she's lost over 50 pounds herself utilizing the very tools she teaches. Today, she's here to chat about her new book titled How to Lose Weight for the Last Time brain-based solutions for permanent weight loss. Katrina, welcome. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. So let's start with your personal journey. You, you, you've gone through this. So let, let's let's start there. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's really easy to think that doctors have it all figured out that, hey, if we all went to medical school, we wouldn't struggle <laughs> with anything related to our bodies anymore. And that's just not the case. Um, my story, you know, I, I definitely liked sugar and, you know, I liked sweets and things like that growing up, but I didn't really, really start struggling with my weight until my uh, medical school, like my medical training. And really what ends up happening during that time is a very gradual progression of t the taking away of things that support you, you know? So if you had maybe during college or before um, that kind of schooling, if you had any kind of hobbies or ways that you like to spend your time, um, you know, you just have less and less time for that and less, less, less and less availability for it as you progress through the process. And over time, you end up kind of just being consumed with what it is that you're doing. Like if you have a family, it's your family in school. And if you don't have a family, it's basically school. So you're working long, long hours, you're exhausted, you're also studying and taking really big, important tests. And then once you get into your internship and residency and really get into that training, it often gets even worse. And they're really, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I think there's a very gradual change maybe possibly happening now, but uh, particularly when I was going through, there was just really no support in place or any teaching of like, well, how do you get through this? like in one piece. And the easiest way to support yourself emotionally is to use food to feel better because it's available. They give you like free food all the time. It's generally not particularly supportive for our bodies. Um, you know, you're exhausted, you're just physically so drained, and there's just nothing that you can really do to make yourself feel better except to eat. So like one thing that I would do, they would give us these meal tickets and I remember specifically during my internship, I was a pediatric resident and worked as a pediatrician, um, being in, on call in the hospital, getting the call that there's, you know, a couple of kids need to be admitted from the ER on back on my way down, realizing, you know what, there's going to be no sleep tonight. Like this is this, I'm just gonna be up all night. Um, I always describe it as like, I, it feel, I felt so tired. It hurt, like so painfully exhausted and on the way <laughs> to the ER, they had what they called the coffee shop, which sounds nice. It sounds like what we think of now is like a really nice, you know, boutique coffee shop. It was not that. It was really just kind of a, a dumpy little place. But it was open 24-7. And they would sell Dove bars, like those ice cream bars, premium ice cream, great chocolate. And I could use my meal tickets to get one for free. So I would go through there, grab the Dove bar, eat that. And it really did make it feel like I could get through the night like a little bit better. It gave me a little bit of energy, kind of made me feel a little dopamine hit, a little like, I'm going to be okay, I can do this. And so that's a pattern that ended up repeating, repeating, repeating. And it's easy, especially when we're in going through hard times in our lives to think like, well, once I just get through this time, this difficult time, then it's going to be better. You know, like then I won't struggle with this anymore. So I kept thinking, oh, I'll sort this all out once I get out in practice thinking that that's going to be the solution. And if anything, it just got more stressful and hard. I started having children. <laughs> and so I had babies. And I had, you know, a medical practice where I'm the one in charge. Like once you're the doctor, it's like that's the buck stops with you. And, um, and so I just really struggled. I could lose weight because I could force myself to follow a restrictive plan and be super miserable throughout it. But as soon as I got to my goal weight, 
it was almost like I thought that I'd had like a brain transplant and I no longer struggled with food anymore, which doesn't make any sense. But it's kind of what I had hoped would happen. Like, oh, this problem is solved now. I can just go back to quote unquote normal eating, which for me was obviously not supportive and too much food for my body because every single time I would gain the weight back again. So I did that for, I mean, really actually a couple decades before I finally was realizing, you know what, this is just not working anymore. I'm just not willing to do this. I'm approaching 40. I have promised myself so many times I won't gain the way back. I have yet again. So obviously what I'm doing isn't working. I have to figure something out. And through a very long and circuitous path, I ended up finding myself um, looking at life coaching as an option. I honestly didn't even know what it was, what life coaching was. But I, by that point, I had identified that I was an emotional eater. I had very much rejected that identity for a long time, thinking like, I don't do that. Like I'm highly functional, like thinking that that was some sort of weakness or something. Um, you know, I just like food, all the stories I told myself. And I, I, outside of life coaching, I realized, you no, know, if emotional eating is eating for any reason that's outside of physical hunger in your body, then yeah, for sure. I'm a card carrying member of that group. Like I definitely do that. So then I started thinking, well, I'm so out of touch with my emotions. I don't even, I mean, I was raised by German immigrants. Like emotions were like not a thing in my family. You just suck it up and get to work. So through life coaching, I was able to actually understand what was really driving the whole overeating uh, thing in the first place. And it wasn't so important necessarily what I was eating or how I was eating, although, you know, certainly there's things that we can do that are more supportive for our bodies. It was much more important that I recognize that I was employing food and sometimes alcohol to help me deal with my emotional life. And so I had to become aware of what that emotional life was and then figure out other ways to support myself emotionally so that I could separate out eating and the pleasure that we get from eating from our emotions, my emotions and, and how I deal with those, both the positives and the negatives. And so once I really learned this and, and really got amazing results for myself, I thought, you know what, I bet you there's a bunch of other women physicians out there who are struggling too. Because I had thought it was because of the way, like the unpredictability of my schedule, you know, just emergencies happen when you're a doctor. I'm like, that's why I can't have the success that I want. And then I realized, no, it actually doesn't have anything to do with that. And I bet you there's a bunch of other doctors out there thinking this is the problem and no one was really out there helping them. And I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and see if anybody wants some help. And that was about six years ago. And it turned out, yeah, a lot of people wanted that help. Before we talk about some of the specifics that worked for you in terms of your weight loss journey and what's in the book, something, a statistic you called out very early on the book, which I, I thought was <laughs> quite interesting. You say that doctors know very little about weight management and nutrition, pointing out that according to 20, a 2017 survey, 63% of U.S. physicians are overweight, overweight or obese. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so just imagine how much shame and humiliation and embarrassment is layered on top of that. Like when you're a doctor, you're supposed to give good advice and know what people are supposed to do and give, you know, informed, um, you know, information to your patients to help them. But either you can't do it yourself, you're not, you know, willing to do it yourself. It's like, it's basically like, do what I say and not as I do. And the worst part is that people can see it on your body. You know, when you're struggling emotionally or struggling in other ways in your life, like people can't just look at you and tell that you are having that struggle, like just going to the grocery store or wherever. But when you struggle with your food, people can tell, they can look at you and see. And so when you're in the office or, you know, when you're taking care of patients, people know that. And like, because I would gain and lose so much, you know, people would come in for their children's, you know, well visits or whatever. Maybe I'd see them every six months or every year. And it would be interesting when like this year they're making a comment, oh, you've lost weight. Then the next year, like depending on where they saw me in the ups and downs, like not saying anything or just kind of like, oh, hi. Okay. You know, it's, it's just, there's this added pressure to be able to be um, a good role model as well. And it's really hard, extra hard when clearly you're not doing what you say they should be doing. So in terms of what worked for you, it sounds like you didn't just go all in on keto or no. you got a hundred percent plant-based or you did right. this diet oh, or that diet. Things, though. Oh, I tried them all. I've done them all. <laughs> so let, let's go there. Cause I think that's, that, that I think is the crux of the book, which I think is interesting. 
because uh, in some regard, if you if you zoom out, all weight loss to some degree, nutrition is in which you hit on. You, your brain plays a significant role in, in terms of the choices we make, in terms of managing emotions, in terms of mindset. Um, so, so let's talk about that for a minute the role our brain plays in, in all of this. Cause I think, and like we talk so much about, you know, eat this, not that and so forth. And I, I think there's some best practices we'll generally agree on, you know, sugar, processed car, you know, we, we all know the things, so to speak, but we don't talk enough about the role of our brain. So let's go there. So really, you know, I look at it like there's, um, you know, the, like the thinking part with our brain that we need to um, address, but there's also just, you know, certain ways of supporting our bodies so that, you know, the signals that the brain sends out are so kind of like accurate, I would say, right? When you are eating a lot of processed food, when you're eating a ton of sugar, um, you know, your hormones are kind of messed up, you know, like the signals aren't right. The brain gets confused about what's important. Um, you will often feel more intense hunger than is really appropriate for the amount of food your body needs. Um, if anybody's ever felt hangry, you know, the combination of hungry and angry, you know, it's kind of like, really, it's that intense. Like, you know, especially if you have weight to lose, like you're not going to die of starvation if you don't eat anything right in that moment. Like, why does it feel like you're going to faint or you feel so, you know, so bad. So definitely there's some things um, that can help with that, particularly our thoughts around what hunger means. You know, some of us are so afraid of hunger that we want to eat now to try to prevent hunger that we might experience later instead of actually just recognizing, hey, you know what, if my body needs food, I will be able to support it. I will be able to meet my own needs. And often those issues stem back to either, you know, transgenerational trauma or, um, you know, just the way that people were raised, you know, like if they're if you had maybe a family with a lot of um a lot of siblings and you needed to eat really, really fast because if you, you know, if you didn't, everyone would eat all the food and then you'd be hungry and have to go to bed hungry later. You know, you might be like, no, I'm afraid of hunger because bad things happen to me if I feel hungry. Like, yes, you have to work through that. But the other piece of this that we don't realize is so important is that, uh, you know, the way that we think about food actually creates our desire. So like actual food, if you think about what food is, it's just, you know, literally like some molecules that are stuck together that are palatable, palatable to us. And, you know, they don't poison us, right? They're digestible and we can get energy out of them. Like that's literally all food is. It just sits there, but we give it so much power with the way that we think. We ask it to do so much for us. We ask it to entertain us, to keep us company to, um, you know, soothe ourselves when we're when we're feeling bad, we ask it to help us to feel even better when we're celebrating, right? Because we can't just be happy, we have to add food to it to try to be happier to try to increase the experience more. And, um, and so we just think that the truth is, such and such food, you know, this, this um, type of cookie is amazing. And it tastes so good. And I have to have that. And it's so sad that I can't have that, or I'm telling myself I can or I shouldn't, when none of that is actually true at all. It's literally just food that's sitting there. And so we create the over desire that we have, like the excessive desire, more desire than is appropriate for how much our bodies need food by the way that we think about food. And so, like I said, we just think it's the truth and we have the opportunity then to, you know, really think about that. Like, I understand that I believe that's true, but when I think that way, it creates these urges to overeat. If anybody who's listening has ever had, you know, like brownies in the kitchen and they're upstairs and they feel like the brownies are calling to them, <laughs> you know, it's like, like intrusive thoughts about the food. It's very important. You need to go eat it. And people will sometimes eat it just to, so they can stop thinking about it. You know, this is over desire. This is the kind of thing that we need. We need to place less importance on these foods, even when they're highly palatable and we like to eat them. Hearing you speak, I can't help but think that this is precisely why restrictive dieting doesn't work, because yeah. there are some amazing foods. Brownies, like brownies, are amazing. And if you and if you go on a diet and and say like I'm just never going to have these again, or you have the keto brownie or the vegan brownie or whatever it might the brownie be that's like adjacent to the good tasting brownie it's like kind of good but not really exactly the which is also a problem and I, i'll use the example halo top like halo top is terrible because it tricks your brain yeah into thinking you need to eat the whole thing 
<laughs> you're better off having the full fat, full sugar. Mark Schatzker wrote a book on this. Like it's fascinating. It's terrible. Uh, so with that said, it, to me, going back, restrictive diets just don't work for that reason. And we are so much better off just, you know, having some sort of, you got to have some sort of diet or protocol. I don't love the word diet protocol in terms of, 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 of how you eat and what you eat and when you eat with setting up time for these are the things I want to enjoy. And, and something that I find valuable, and I've said this before on, on the show, I hate the word cheat. I like the word treat. <laughs> it's not a cheat. It's a treat. We don't cheat on ourselves. That is not what how we approach food. I love donuts. And if I'm going to have a donut, I'm going to have an amazing donut. And it is a treat. It is not a cheat. Yes. And you're going to taste it, right? Like we are meant as humans to get natural pleasure from our food. Like, you know, it's we're allowed to eat food that tastes good to us, even just our day-to-day -day regular food. Like you don't need to force yourself to eat the latest superfood because it's what people said you know, is healthy and you should eat that. Like you should eat food that tastes good to you. And when you have your occasional treats, making sure that you're actually in a positive emotional state, ready to enjoy the heck out of that brownie, right? Like you're not gobbling it down. You're not using it to try to reward yourself after a hard day. You're instead going like, I'm so excited to get the full like human experience that one gets when we eat a really good brownie and we are just like letting it melt in our mouth and tasting every bit of it. And then we're also stopping when we've had enough. Like we're not just like how many times do we eat like a huge pile of ice cream? Like our tongues are numb. We can't even taste it anymore but we're still like eating it because there's still more left. We don't have to do that. Yeah. So how do we, how do we stop doing that? Cause sometimes there are just things that are just so good and you just want to keep on going. <laughs> well, so I think part of the reason why we keep on going is because we tell ourselves like we shouldn't really have this or, you know, this isn't really good for us. So then we get into that mode of like, this is our chance. Like, well, I'm already having it. So like, if I don't really normally get to eat this, then this is my chance to have as much of it as I can. So to your point, that restriction, first of all, is just not true. When we tell ourselves like, I can't have that, or I shouldn't have that. It's like literally says who you're an adult, you get to eat whatever you want to eat. You know what I mean? Like there's no laws that you are not allowed to do this. But when we tell ourselves that we're not allowed to have it, or we shouldn't have it, then all it does is create more desire. Then we just want it even more. And then when we do have it, we're like, I need to have all of it. I need to get my full fill because I don't know when I'm going to have it again. That's, the, again, the brain overemphasizing the importance of it. So I struggled with that so much. A big way that I worked myself through this was literally practice, like getting foods that I normally would overeat and practice really paying attention to the taste and stopping eating them as soon as the um, the kind of pleasure or the really positive, really good taste started to peak. You know, once the next bite was not as good as the one before that, then I usually ended up taking one more just to confirm. <laughs> it's, yep, it's not actually quite as good. And then asking myself to stop and showing myself basically as an experiment, practicing, like, what is the experience like if you stop? Will I really feel like I didn't get enough? Will I really feel, you know, deprived or like so sad that it's over? And, you know, really, no. The experience that I had was that I was like, that was really awesome. I'm glad I really took my time and tasted that and I got the pleasure out of it. I don't need to eat more. Often we eat more because we think in our brains that it tastes better. But if we actually check in with our taste buds, it's not tasting that good anymore. And then we just eat it until, to the point where we don't even feel good, right? We feel stuffed or sometimes, you know, some people just physically don't feel good when they're, when they're eating things like that. So I think we just have to be open to the idea that there could be another way that would also feel amazing and we would still get a bunch of pleasure out of the food, but it wouldn't involve overeating it. And then the other thing is just the scarcity that we have around food thinking like, but this is so good. And this is like the only time that maybe I can have this later, you're traveling or something. But you know what, there are so many amazing things like millions and millions and probably hundreds of millions of things across the world that taste so good. So if it's going to be this thing, that it can be the next thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like my husband and I went to Paris and we we're in, you know, a bakery or a patisserie, you know, there's this amazing, all these desserts. And I remember feeling like I know what I teach works because normally I would have wanted one of everything, totally stuff, feeling sick. And instead I was just like, you know what, checking with my body, I actually don't really want that right now. 
and I'm sure it would taste amazing. And also there's so many other amazing things to eat here in Paris and in the world. Like I'm never going to be without amazing things to eat. So that doesn't mean that I have to eat this thing right now. When in Paris, enjoy the croissant, but don't eat like a dozen of them. Exactly. Even the French don't eat croissants all the time. <laughs> so, you know, spending time on on mindset, you know, I, I, I think about it two ways. So one, there's the the problem of someone has to get started. You know, I, I want to I wanna lose X. So that's like problem number one. Some people just can't get there. They, they just, they can't do it. And then there's, you know, problem number two is, okay, I lost X, but now I want to keep it off. And that's, I don't know the statistics on how many people lose in the first place and then can't keep it off. But my gut says it's very high. Most people lose something, but then it goes right back. And so can you talk about mindset and the role it plays as we look at those kind of two problems? For sure. So what I see a lot is that people are deciding they want to lose weight. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to say women in particular, that's the population that I work with. Um, I think it applies to some men as well, but I think often for men, it's just a little bit different, just societally and things like that. But we start off with this idea that we need to lose weight or we want to lose weight. And maybe it even would help us, you know, um, you know, physically, maybe the doctor has mentioned, it would actually be helpful to us if we lost weight. But there's this, um, even if logically we know this isn't the case for many of us, there's this um, deep subconscious belief that once we get thin, like then good things are going to happen. You know, like what's standing in the way between, you know, me now and the life that I want to have is my body or my weight. And so it puts a lot of pressure on the weight loss to be the solution. The other thing to remember is like, if you have been, you know, successful in your life and doing all these amazing things, but relying on food and emotional eating, and maybe possibly alcohol as well, to get you through the hard times, and then you're asking yourself to no longer use that as that crutch, as that way of supporting yourself, and you don't put other support systems in place, it's going to be really hard. You know, so a lot of people talk about self-sabotage or I was doing so well for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And then this thing happened. And then I was like right back on the train of overeating again. And then we make that mean that something's wrong with us or, you know, our bodies are broken or, you know, we're weak or undisciplined or whatever we think it is when that's not that at all. It's that we don't have another support system in place. We don't really know why we eat the food, why we rely on it so heavily. And I will just say that I have definitely worked with people who have found that, you know, they need to do some kind of personal work on themselves first before they really can have success with weight loss. Otherwise, they're just sort of spinning their wheels, focusing on, you know, the eating and the not eating. It's like very much a distraction from the fact that like deep down, they don't have a lot of confidence, like their self-worth isn't great. Like their opinion of their, themselves, the way they talk to themselves, their inner self-talk is quite harsh. Um, you know, for some people really, you know, quite mean. And, you know, that it's very uncomfortable <laughs> to live with yourself, right? To be with yourself without something to distract you from that. If being with you is is really harsh and mean, it's like, imagine having someone over your shoulder, just like saying super mean and harsh things to you day in and day out. You just be like, oh my gosh, you have to stop. But that's what it's like inside a lot of people's heads. So we have to do some work to um, to accept ourselves as we are, love ourselves as we are, create a relationship where we know that we will actually do what we say we're going to do for ourselves. Of course, we do it, what we say we're going to do for other people, so many of us. But when it comes to ourselves, we let ourselves down. So sometimes we have to do some work there to get ourselves really in a place of um, a strong um, you know, kind of personal foundation. And then we just lose weight because we want to, you know, we maybe prefer to live in a smaller body, or we know that like a certain medical problem would benefit from us weighing less, but we're not hinging like the only way I know, uh, you know, I'll know that I'm, um, you know, worthy and an acceptable person and valuable in this world is if I lose this weight, it puts so much pressure on the weight loss. And it often isn't sustainable then. So, so I think, you know, we just think of like, I've just got to like overhaul the pantry and like, yeah, maybe that would be helpful. You know, maybe, maybe you should do that. Maybe that'd be helpful, but don't forget about the emotional part. Like what else are you going to do when it gets hard to support yourself and not even necessarily when the dieting or the weight loss part gets hard, but when life is just the way life is, 
just certain stressors and things come up, how will you support yourself differently? You know, you just have to recognize too in society, it's like, it's wine o'clock and like, you know, like you deserve to have whatever, like you have to really go like, but do I want to think about it that way? Maybe that's not the right way. And then when it comes to maintenance, um, you know, I kind of alluded to it before the idea that like I would get to my goal weight and think I'd had a brain transplant, you know, because I would just be like, I'll just be a different person then and I won't struggle anymore. And what we have to really recognize is that really the things that got us to our goal weight are all the things that we have to continue. So many of us, because we're so unfamiliar with maintenance, we think that we're going to get to the goal weight and then we can stop doing these things. So if we're doing a lot of things to help us to lose weight that are a means to an end, particularly with our food, right? If you're like, well, I'm just going to do keto to get the weight off and then I'm going to figure something else out. It's probably going to be hard. So I actually really recommend that you know, you eat in a way to lose weight that you're willing to eat ongoing. So like, don't cut out anything that you're not willing to never eat again in your life. You know, like if you're going to be super low carb, I'm, that, I'm not saying that can't be amazing for certain people. But if you think about eating that way for the whole rest of your life, and you're not super excited about it, then maybe that's not going to be the way for you, you know, because you got to you've got to get to maintenance. And then you've got to figure out like, who am I as a person? who, you know, doesn't use food to regulate their internal life, you know, their emotional life. And, and that's, I think the biggest thing is like all the things that supported you to get there, you have to keep doing those ongoing. You know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking out loud about the Mediterranean diet and how it, it's just, it's kind of in the middle. Most everyone agrees with Mediterranean diet principles, but it's probably not going to get you to losing a lot of weight fast compared to other diets. But look, it makes a lot of sense. And I think something I found interesting with regards to keeping the weight off, you talked about in the book, it's something I had heard before, is a weight set point. You know, you say we have a temperature set point, you know, 98.6 or whatever it is these days, but we, we don't talk about weight set point and weight set point plays a role when we lose that five pounds, 10 pounds or whatever it might be. So can we spend a moment on weight set point? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think if anybody's interested in learning more, um, uh, Dr. Jason Fung's book, The Obesity Code is a really great resource for this. Um, really what it, it, I mean, it makes sense, right? That our bodies um, have kind of a, a place where they feel comfortable in terms of weight. And even when you think back to like, you know, several decades ago when people weren't struggling with their weight so much, there were many people, you know, who just were like the same clothing size, just their whole adult life, you know, and sometimes they'd eat more and sometimes they'd eat less and it would just always even out. So what happens is when our bodies are, um, when we're not eating tons and tons of sugar and processed food all the time, um, we become more insulin sensitive. So that means that um, our bodies need to, our pancreas needs to produce less insulin in order for all the, um, you know, the glucose, like the, the um, main building block of the food, once it's digested, like for it to get where it needs to go. So it doesn't need to put out so much insulin. Um, just for a frame of reference, um, when you are um, experiencing type 2 diabetes, that is when you're very, very insulin resistant. So your body is needing to pump out tons and tons of insulin because um, it, the body just isn't functioning the way it should. So, um, so what raises your weight set point is being more insulin resistant. Um, so when you're eating a lot of processed food and sugar and eating regularly and like not giving your body too many breaks from digesting, that can push that insulin um, that or sorry that weight set point up higher. We're more insulin resistant. And um, by changing that, when we lose weight, when we are eating in a way that's more supportive to the body, um, it will lower that weight set point. And what's interesting is when we just do calorie restriction, you know, like kind of the like calories in, calories out kind of thing, like what people always talked about, like saying like, oh, it's just thermodynamics, except we are a complex, you know, organism. We are not a simple machine. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when when we look at it that way, what what the research has shown is that the weight set point actually doesn't reduce, which really makes sense because so many people would calorie count and restrict their way down to losing weight, and then they'd gain weight back very very quickly. And it's because the body was trying so desperately to get that weight back to the set point, 
right? The set point's higher. You've lost weight. It's like something seriously is, is a problem. You're freezing cold. You're cranky. You're hungry all the time. Like we need to eat and we need to get the weight up. When you're focusing on, um, on becoming more insulin sensitive, that weight set point reduces. Then when you are at your goal weight, your body really wants to stay there. It's, it doesn't feel like so many people have lost weight, but they're like to keep it off was like so much work. It doesn't feel that way anymore because you're working more with your body and with your physiology. So if we're looking at weight loss, you know, I'll say under 25 pounds, over 25 pounds, if I'm going to take the under 25 pound group, do you think it's more about the weight set point or mindset? Like, what, what do you think for that group? Because I think that represents a big part of the population. You mean 20 people who have about 25 pounds or less? I, I'm just, I think that's, you tell me if the number's higher, but yeah. I was trying to think of like the majority of the population. Like, I think that's kind of fair. 30-ish, 25, 30? Yeah. yeah. Like what's, is it that or is it cravings or is it emotional eating or mindset or restrictive dieting? Or is it like, if you had to, what's your sense of what really kind of doesn't work for them and why the weight comes right back? I think it's a, a combination of all for everybody, probably some are more so than others. I think if you have um, dieted a lot, then weight set point is probably more of a factor. But if you're someone who just, you know, put on some weight during COVID for the first time in your life, you know, it, that might not be as much of a factor. The way I look at it, you know, I obviously work with doctors and they like to get lab tests and things and they'll be like, oh, I want to, I'm going to get some labs and find out like how insulin resistant I am. I'm like, I mean, you can if you want to, but you know, it's safe to assume that if you weigh more than your body, you know, ideally does, like you have some element of insulin resistance. So we don't need to necessarily like quantify it or know or to follow that trend or anything like that. Like sometimes I think we can complicate this unnecessarily. Um, just recognizing, you know, what like um, doing things that keep my insulin levels lower is only going to benefit me. And so that can be that. And I'm not saying, I just want to be really clear because people get confused and they think that I'm saying you should eat low carb. And that's not what I'm saying, right? Because you can still totally eat tons of carbohydrates with, you know, starchy vegetables and whole grains and fruit and things like that. Like it's all amazing. Um, but I'm talking about like more processed sugar and, um, and even, you know, um, some like, you know, white flour type based um, foods that are really easily digestible and quickly digestible in our bodies, which makes our insulin levels um, shoot up really high. So, so, um, so the other thing that's really interesting is when we eat in this way, that's more supportive, that's more, um, you know, slowly processed in our bodies, keeps our insulin levels um, more even, um, it's actually easier to manage our minds. So these all factor in together, like how much is mindset and how much is over desired, like it all factors in, you know, like if you are, um, are someone who has uh, kind of hit a certain point where you're like, you know, emotionally, I've had this struggle. And then I started this pattern of, you know, ice cream Sundays every night, while we were on lockdown. <laughs> and now I've just kept up that pattern. You know, we have to kind of look at like, okay, if we take that away, like, what was the problem that the ice cream Sunday was solving for you? Because you were doing it for a reason, you know, like there was something happening there, whether it was just, you know, you were looking to feel better, you were feeling kind of restless, you were feeling kind of bored, you were feeling a little stir crazy, whatever that was, let's just find out what that is and see what it's like to work through that and process that instead of just trying to use food to distract ourselves or avoid it. So I think it's, it's all, it's really, um, all of it factors in. I don't know that for really anybody in our society, that emotional eating isn't really a part of it. I think there are definitely places in the world where that's not as much of a thing, but I think in, you know, at least sort of our industrialized world where, especially where there's just food available everywhere and so much of it being processed, um, it's just easy for us to get into this habit of eating constantly, which keeps our insulin levels elevated, which makes us more insulin resistant. And then we also think like, I need to eat this food. I mean, I can't believe how many people are like, well, I need to have a snack. I'm like, says who? <laughs> I mean, my kids even, you know, my kids would have, you know, they had to bring a snack to school. And I remember talking to my husband. I'm like, did you eat snack in second grade? Like, did you need a, I mean, that wasn't even a thing. We ate breakfast and we ate lunch. It just wasn't a thing. That's like a whole nother discussion about school lunch and kids and snacking. And uh, <laughs> as you were talking, I was thinking about during the pandemic when we were living in Brooklyn, um, our office was four blocks away. 
And my wife and I worked together and we would walk to the office in the morning and walk back. And on the way back, there was a pop-up restaurant bar that had frozen margaritas and they were amazing. And it was like right on the walk. And, <laughs> and we just found ourselves almost like four or five days a week. Oh, we'll just stop for one. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, you don't need to get like, you don't need to judge yourself for having done that. Like, of course you did that. That made so much sense. Here you are in New York, like this, you know, like hot center, hot spot for COVID. Like it, it, there's so much fear. There's so much, so many things going on. Like that made sense to do that then. Yeah, it did. And then I there still, becomes still, a point where it doesn't make sense yeah, anymore. I, I, still, I still judge myself, but uh we're, we're glad he, he moved away and, you know, we, we obviously moved, but we totally did that. And I, I think, you know, coming back to emotional eating and more specifically cravings, um, look, cravings are real for everyone. I don't care where you are in your wellness journey. And you talk about being fat adapted as a great strategy for cravings. So can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So when you're not eating, um, you know, a ton of more processed foods and sugar on a regular basis, right? We're not saying you can't ever have it. We're just saying like not all the time or not frequently. Then um, again, your body just goes back to the way it was really designed to work. So if you think about humans as we are being around for 200,000 years, you know, it's really just been like the last 100 to 200 years that we even have a lot of these processed foods or, you know, they're, they're even available to the masses, but the last 30 to 40 years where it's like literally everywhere, there's just food everywhere all the time. And we're being encouraged to eat all the time. So our bodies have not evolved to keep up with this. Our bodies don't know what to do with this. And, and so when we are eating that all the time, um, it really, it, there's a reason we don't feel good because our bodies were not designed to function in the, you know, eating all this food this way. So what helps you to become fat ad adapted is to take a break from eating those more processed foods on a regular basis, eating food that still tastes good to you. Cause there's tons of food that tastes really, really good. That isn't processed and, um, and eating it to the point where you feel, you know, sated and then not eating again until you're physically hungry, which for a lot of people will just be about two or three times a day of eating. But then like you're not snacking, you're having like a real solid meal. What ends up happening then is your insulin levels drop in between your meals. And um, and that's just the way your body's supposed to function. So when you're more fat adapted, what ends up happening is that your hunger um, is first of all, just much less, you're just a lot less hungry. You're just you know, like the amount of hunger you feel is a lot less. So we talked about over hunger. This is a great way of solving for that. Um, but also then when you do feel physical hunger, it doesn't feel so strong. It doesn't feel like it's clobbering you over the head. Like it's, you know, like a wave crashing down and you better eat right now, or there's going to be something bad that happens. You know, it's really like, I think of it as like a little wave in the Caribbean, just kind of, kind of like lapping at your ankles, just a little, little suggestion. Hey, would you like to eat a little something now could be cool. And, um, and if you don't eat because it's not the right time or you just don't want to for whatever reason, after 10, 15 minutes or so, that hunger goes away and the body meets its own needs by utilizing the extra fat that's stored on your body. This is literally how bodies were intended to function. You know, like humans never had so much excess food around. And so we needed some stores to be able to get through the times when food wasn't available. Well, now food is always available. So we have to create times when the body, you know, uh, is going to tap into that, um, to that extra. So we call that gluconeogenesis. It's a big, long word that basically just, just means converting your fat back into glucose, just energy that your cells can use. And that's how we lose weight, right? Like we have to turn that fat into energy and actually, you know, burn that off. So when you're fat adapted, it doesn't mean that you don't eat, you definitely do, but you're just um, eating in response to those physical hunger signals. So they will be a lot less intense and a lot less frequent. And people just find like, I, I love it because I had this experience too. And I love it when my clients say they're like, I cannot believe how little I am hungry and how good this food tastes. <laughs> you know, like they are feeling amazing. They have more energy. They're sleeping better. Like they just, they, what they always say is, I didn't know how bad I felt until now I feel good. Like I just thought how I felt was normal. And now that I feel so much better, I realize, wow, I actually felt pretty crummy there for a long time. So, um, so being fat adapted again doesn't mean that you can't have some, you know, process things or have some sugar from time to time. It's just not something that's incorporated into your day to day. 
And so you've, you've mentioned not having a ton of processed food, not having a ton of sugar. How, how would you describe your general nutrition philosophy? Yeah. Well, so I don't think personally that like any, um, you know, fancy um, kitchen tools or blenders or like, you know, a spiralizer or like any of that stuff is required. Of course, if you want to use them, go for it. Um, I think that I believe that when we eat simple food that um, and we are in a fat adapted state, that means our taste buds actually change too. So that, you know, like raspberries taste sweet to us again and things like that. Like you can, we don't need to complicate, you know, our food and have it still taste really, really good. Like I have people who live in New York city are like, you know, I'm not going to be cooking a lot of stuff or, you know, I'm going to be eating out a lot or people who have, um, you know, cultural dietary restrictions, medical dietary um, restrictions, but it doesn't have to be complicated. I think we just make creating meals for ourselves at home way more complicated than they need than it needs to be. And then it feels like too much. We're too tired. We don't feel like doing it. And then we just order pizza, which makes sense, right? If that's how you think it has to be, of course, you're going to want to do that sometimes. So, so when we just really simplify it down to just some basic supportive foods, which are going to vary for different people. So what I, you know, one of the biggest things I encourage is um, for everybody to become an expert in their own body. Like some people are going to feel amazing plant-based. It's not going to be the right thing for everybody. You know, some people are going to love paleo. It's not going to be the right thing for everybody. So, like the Mediterranean diet, you know, maybe somebody's like, yeah, that's great, but you're supposed to eat a lot of fish and I hate fish. Okay, then that's not going to be your thing. You know, we just have to kind of figure out what that is. But when we're more plant forward, let's say, right, we make sure we're getting some vegetables in, we have some, you know, some whole grains and whatever protein we want and, you know, fruit if we like that and things like that. Like, and then we eat when our bodies tell us it needs food, right? The actual physical hunger and stop when we feel sated. Like it's, it's so simple. Like that's all you have to do. So we don't need to have like boxes that we put our food in and that's how much we get, or like we have to weigh stuff or measure stuff. But at the same time, like if you think about how bodies were evolutionarily designed, nobody was creating a smoothie with a whole bunch of fruit in it. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm just like, you know, Hey, you know, I'm not saying you can never have a smoothie again, but maybe while you're losing weight, like just chew that fruit up you know, and check in with yourself on like, am I actually full? Like, are you really going to eat that much kale? Like you should probably just chew the kale up. <laughs> you know? I do love Vitamix and I do love a great smoothie. Me too. My blend tech is my fave. I love it. <laughs> How do you think about protein? So protein is, is a thing where I think a lot of people get mixed up. Um, I think that, again, some people, if they are paying attention to how they feel, will notice that they feel better when they're on a bit of a higher protein diet. Um, and then there's other people who are, just don't want to eat that for whatever reason. Like, you know, it, it can even be environmental reasons, right? They just don't want to be consuming a lot of, um, you know, animal-based um, protein. Um, the good news that I have about protein is that um, you probably need less than you think. So if you've ever worked with a trainer or, you know, um, you know, anybody who's kind of like really into fitness, they really tend to tell us like, you need all of this protein. You have these high protein goals. So then you're drinking like, you know, these shakes with whey in them and like all these things to try to get more protein. And, um, you know, that's one way of doing things. And if that's working for you, amazing, like keep it up. But if it's not working for you or it's not something that you love or that you want to keep doing, then just recognizing actually you don't even have to eat like there's naturally occurring protein. I mean, I was a vegan for five years. That's another part of my story. So like you can get protein in a lot of ways. There's protein in vegetables, there's protein like in, you know, whole grains. Like you don't have to be so like, I'm not going to have success because I'm not getting enough protein. And the only way I can lose weight is I need to be eating, you know, making myself sick on chicken breasts. Like, no, you don't. There are lots of great plant-based proteins, whether you're talking about legumes or but a lot of the trainers will say that you can't get enough, you know, or the only way you can get enough of the plant-based proteins is if you're drinking like the protein powders and stuff like that. And I'll just tell you from my personal experience, I never met a protein powder that I really liked. Like it's just never, I've tried and I've tried so many of them again, going back to like normal food that tastes good to you. Like then that's just not a thing for me. I'm not going to force myself to eat or drink things that don't taste good to me. Like we can, we can trust our bodies to guide us when we're supporting them, meaning like when you're not eating a bunch of processed stuff and things are functioning normally, your body's going to let you know, like, was that a good thing? Do I feel good when I have that? How's my digestion? And then you can let that lead you. So I think so much of what you say makes a lot of sense and is fairly straightforward. Yet 
we're just terrible at managing weight. Like it just, I think we just com- we overcomplicate things, but also we don't realize how much of this issue is based in our brains. You know, like if you're, if anybody's familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, that basically states that like your thoughts create your feelings and your feelings drive your actions, which create your results. What we're usually focused on in weight loss is the actions, right? Like, you, you know, do these, eat these, th- these things, make these recipes, buy these groceries, work out in this way. Um, and if you do those things, the promise is that you will lose weight and that you'll get that result that you want. And the fact of the matter is, is probably most of the time, if you do that, the way they say it probably will work and it probably will help you. But we, either can't or aren't willing to continue doing it ongoing. So what's that about, right? Like (laughs) that's the bigger issue. So what comes before actions is the way we feel our emotions. And what comes before that is the way that we think. So if we have thoughts that create feelings that drive the action of overeating, right? Or eating food that we know doesn't support us, we will always end up going back to our old patterns and you know, like for me, it resulted in weight gain again. And then we end up in this cycle again. So what we need to do is we need to figure out, first of all, actions that we're willing to take ongoing, not just doing means to an end kinds of things, but like, what am I actually willing to do ongoing? And it doesn't feel like a hardship that I'm happy to do. And then how do I need to think and feel to be able to consistently take those actions so I can get the result of losing the weight and keeping it off long term. That's but you know, you're talking about like a Mediterranean diet doesn't um, make you lose weight very quickly. And you know, we see so many people are in such a rush. Well, why are they in a rush to lose weight? Well, as I said before, right, we think that if I could just lose weight, then all these things will be better in my life. No, your body will be smaller, and your brain will be the same. You know, your life, like all the problems that you have, you're still going to have those problems. And so we rush thinking like it's better on the other side. And it's not really. So I always say like, if this is the last time you're losing weight and you're really going to sort this all out, then what is the rush? Like, let's just take our time and figure it out so that we don't end up regaining it back again and having to start over. So let's say we had unlimited resources as a country. Would we be better served by saying to everyone, okay, we're going to set you up with a psychiatrist or a coach like yourself and then a nutritionist? I mean, here's the thing. What I think is like, well, first of all, everybody could benefit from coaching. Um, I mean, definitely therapy. I'm a huge fan of therapy. I think it's amazing. Um, but there are a lot of people who are like, you know, I, I'm, you know, really highly functional. I don't really necessarily have a problem that's holding me back. I would just like to create something new or I have this big goal and coaching can be really amazing for that. So, so that's, that can be really good. But here's the thing. I'm not saying anything negative about nutritionists at all because they're amazing as particularly when people need to have some like, you know, diabetics who need some specific guidance or someone who has, you know, celiac or gluten sensitivity, you know, of course they are You amazing. need to get educated around food, obviously. Exactly. But I don't think that a lack of education is most people's problem. You know what I mean? It's like, I, you know, if we're like talking about like, oh, we have unlimited resources, like, do people really not know that Mountain Dew is, you know, a problem to drink? I don't know. I, I think we have <laughs> both. I, I, I believe I, I've met some very highly educated people who still don't know how to eat and they, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example I've, I've used before on the show. It's recent. It's top of mind. Uh, you know, pirate's booty, you know, a friend of our five-year-old, we were very proud of our five-year-old because her friend offered her pirate's booty and, and Ellie said, you know, no, thank you, which I, I'm glad she said, no, thank you. Don't you know that's terrible for you? And I was like, that's our girl. That's our girl. Uh, you know, and like really lovely kid and really love, but, you know, so, but, but I think there are tons of foods out there that we think are healthy or, and they're, pro, and they're processed, processed garbage. The problem though, is that people can't agree. And, and really my, the only reason I'm hesitating about this is because again, like no nutritionist is going to know better than you about how to feed your body. If you actually pay attention, part of the problem, I'm, I'm really like evangelical about this. We have been sold this lie that if we struggle with our weight, that there's something wrong with us and we obviously can't be trusted to know what we need, 
So someone else is going to be the expert who needs to tell us what to do, right? So that could be a nutritionist, it can be a weight loss coach, it can be, you know, whatever program. And that's just really not the truth. Yeah, maybe there's some education, but if we really, like the nutritionist can't tell you when you're hungry, they can't tell you how food feels in your body. It, it, it's tough though, and I see why it's such a slippery slope. I'll use the, 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 the term intuitive eating. And, and yeah, I kind of agree with that, but I could also see how it can go wildly wrong. Intuitive eating is great for people who know how to manage their emotional life. But when people are emotional eaters, they will think that their emotional need is their intuition telling them that they need to eat some ice cream. Exactly. And I think that's the big problem. I think that can kind of work for me because... I don't have that issue, but for someone who does, it's my body's is telling me a Twinkie and I'm going to have a Twinkie and I feel, and it's just like, oh, this is a disaster. Yeah. The way that you can trust it is by taking away the process stuff, right? Like that's when you start going like, well, you know what I sometimes like to say is I like, rather than just like, what does my body need? I'm like, what do, if I really think about like my cells in my body, like what do my cells need? And you know, they never need a brownie. Like, what do they need? They need like water. They need, <laughs> you know, they need some hydration. They need some, you know, some vitamins, right? They're never really asking for, you know, stuff that like a Twinkie, you know what I mean? But everybody's going to have that own personal relationship. And I just think that when other people are telling us what we have to do, so many of us end up having at least a part of us who that just wants to rebel. It's like, don't tell me what to do. I'm not going to do that. I, I love that reframe. What are what are my cells hungry for? Yeah. Like, they're like, yeah, you know, the kale's probably a good idea. I would like that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so in writing this book... And in your work, I'm curious, like, what's the most surprising research you've come across where you've just said, wow, like, how are we not talking about this? I mean, gosh, I mean, I think I think the biggest thing, like what you pointed out before, is how many people in the healthcare space, you know, because it's not just doctors, nurses and other, you know, allied profess professionals in the healthcare space are also really, really struggling. And um, and just there's just. <laughs> There's so little guidance. Like everybody says, like, this is the way, like you have to eat this way, this way, you know, counting macros is going to be the way, like I have the solution. And I just think we need to just back out and recognize that there's lots and lots of solutions. So why aren't we actually following these solutions? That's the part that we have to look at. And nobody's talking about that. That's what's most surprising. And that's what I feel really like is the impact that I want to make is like, not just even with the general public, because of course, that's important too. But I want doctors and just the healthcare industry to understand that like telling a patient who struggled with their weight that they just need to use willpower to lose weight is you know, borderline harmful. Like the, the research shows that willpower doesn't work. You cannot do that. Like it's just not helpful. And and doctors need to be armed with better resources and better information to help their patients. And that doesn't necessarily mean what they should eat and not eat. It means backing it out and going like, how can you actually get the support that you need so you don't need to use food to solve for the non-physical hunger problems that you experience in your life? Agreed. And in closing, I know there's no silver bullet, but I'll still ask the question. Is there one thing that everyone can do tomorrow that would help them manage their weight a bit better? You know, I think one of the best things to do is um, for anybody who knows who maybe is like, yeah, for sure, like at night or whenever, like I'm grabbing this thing that I don't really, you know, to eat that I don't really need. Um you know, and they, and they don't really even know how to stop or how do I get myself to stop wanting a treat at night or something like that. What I suggest is don't tell yourself you can't have the treat, but see if you can create a little bit of space between the idea that you have of I should eat that thing, like let me go to the pantry or whatever it is, and actually putting it in your mouth, right? Like there's a little potential space there right now and let's expand that a little bit. So you're not saying you can't eat it. You're just saying, hey, before I eat this thing, let me just check in with myself and find out what's actually going on. Like, what is the problem I'm asking this food to solve? Why am I actually eating this? And it's not going to be because it tastes good or because it looks good or because I want it. Those are all thoughts that increase our desire. There's going to be something going on for you. And maybe you could just identify what it is. And then you still can have it totally. And then maybe the next step after that is going like, okay, identify that this is the emotion. And then maybe I could ask myself to just stay with it for 60 seconds. Like, let me just find out how I know I feel that way. Where is that in my body? 
Like what happens when I just breathe and stay with it for a second? I'm not saying I can't eat the food. I'm just going to give myself 60 seconds and just start to create more of a space rather than saying you can't have it, you shouldn't have it. Maybe we can get to a place where after five minutes of you feeling that emotion, you actually find that you don't even really want the food anymore. Right. So then we don't have to like make sure it's not in the house. We don't have to battle with ourselves. We don't have to play games. I better go upstairs and better brush my teeth so that I don't want to eat again. Like we just legitimately don't want it anymore. It's not hard to overeat when you don't actually want to eat the food. That's the place that we want to get to. Not where you don't enjoy food, but where you could really just, you know, take it or leave it, which is what I call peace and freedom around food. Where you could eat it, you know it tastes good. Also, you could not have it and you're also fine. And either way is okay. Well said, Katrina. Thank you so much. Thank you.